Lately, I've been playing a lot of Noita, the most recent release from NOLA Games. It combines my favorite genre, roguelikes, with the mechanics of popular falling sand games like Powder Toy. While playing, I realized that I'd never taken the time to dive in and figure out how these types of sand games work. So with that in mind, let's explore the tech behind sand games like Noita, as I discuss how I implemented my version of it. For this, I'm using Gunslinger, which is my open source C99 framework I've been working on for games, tools, and visualizers. It's portable and compiles for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it comes with a few examples for quickly getting started. I even used it to make all the animations for this video using a really crappy vector renderer I wrote over the course of a few days. There's a GitHub link in the description for anyone interested in checking it out. In my research, I was able to find multiple websites, as well as a GDC talk where one of the devs from NOLA Games, Petri, discusses a lot of the algorithms surrounding how a simple sand falling game works, as well as how the data could be structured and processed. First, we need to define a few things. Falling sand simulations are basically a form of complex cellular automata. You can think of most cellular automatas as a type of turn-based game, where you have a world that's comprised of a grid of cells, and where each turn you modify the state of each cell in your grid based on the neighbors that surround that cell. One of the most classically used examples is John Conway's Game of Life. As you can tell, these rules are really simple, but incredibly complex machines and simulations can be built out of just using these rules. Alright, so with that said, let's go back to Noita. Our entire game world is made up of a 2D array of particle data. Each particle is a structure containing all of the information it needs in order to know how to behave in the world, such as its ID, total lifetime, color, and whether or not it's been updated yet for this particular frame. Each frame of our simulation, we iterate through the particle data row by column. For each cell in our grid, we examine its ID type. For empty cells, we ignore them. And for any other IDs, we'll call the update function for that cell's type. So let's take a look at a contrived example. Here we have a single sand block placed somewhere in the grid. When we get to its update loop, the sand will follow this set of rules. If the block below it is empty, we'll move down. Otherwise, if the block below and to the left is empty, we'll move down to the left. Otherwise, if the block below and to the right is empty, then we'll move there. And if all else fails, we'll just stay put. And with just this, the results are quite interesting already. And the beauty of this is that the rules are really simple, but we can alter them and change certain properties in order to get more refined and realistic configurations, as we'll see later on. I should also mention, as a general rule, all of our particles will be confined to the space of the world and simply won't be able to leave the bounds of it. Water and other liquids initially behave exactly the same as sand, falling down and looking left and right below them for a place to move. However, unlike sand, when these first three rules fail, they will also look to their immediate left and right respectively. This tends to give off the effect of flowing to simulate the property that water will attempt to fill any void it finds available to it. So again, with these simple rules, we have a decent starting point for sand and water. But we're not done. As I mentioned earlier, these rules can be modified and adapted in order to achieve more realistic results. And up until this point, we haven't actually been taking velocity or any other forces into account. This of course means that all of our particles will fall at a constant speed of one cell per frame, and the water will flow, well, just as slowly. Let's add a constant rate of acceleration for gravity to change our velocity, as well as for liquids, a spread factor velocity which will allow us to spread faster left and right. Yeah, that looks terrible. Here's the issue. Previously, each particle could only ever move one cell at a time, so it was only ever interested in its immediate neighbors. When we add velocity or any other forces into the mix, we're now interested in every single particle that our particle could interact with along its way to its final position. So looking at this example of the water, there are moments where the water is unable to spread anywhere because its requested position is unavailable, so it stops completely and causes this repeated jagged effect. So here's my naive solution to fix this. 
Using the particle's velocity, we'll compute its desired next position for this frame. We'll then travel to every cell along that path. If we run into anything along the way, as is the case here, we'll stop and just leave the particle in the last free spot that we found. Now with that change, our water is able to flow in a much more convincing manner, and our sand particles can fall at a faster rate. Alright, time to add in another particle. Let's do something stationary made out of wood. And this thing's pretty simple to update. It won't be affected by gravity or any other forces. However, whenever the particles start to fall, you start to get some really cool emergent behaviors, especially when you, say, erase parts of the wall. Or when you flood various valleys and areas and watch it spill over into the surrounding floor. I want to jump ahead to fire. It's one of my favorite particles, mainly because of all the dynamic behaviors that just naturally emerge from it. It's destructive, it only lives for a short amount of time, and in its most simple version, the only way it's able to move is by consuming particles next to it that are flammable. This also generates a lot of smoke, as you can see from the footage. Smoke is pretty simple to do. If you think about it, it's really just sand, but inverted. So instead of falling down due to gravity, the smoke will just rise to the top of the world and then kind of pool up there. So at this point, we've assembled kind of a nice collection of particles. We have sand, water, fire, embers, and smoke. Adding new ones really should become second nature once we have our base rules down. Gunpowder, for instance, works almost exactly the same as sand does. However, it has a very high flammability chance. Salt works exactly the same as sand as well. However, it has a chance to dissolve in water. It's also less dense than water, so you can say that if it's surrounded by water particles, for instance, then it has a chance to rise to the top. Lava is liquid in movement, however it has a really high chance to catch things on fire. Steam works just like smoke, however it's a byproduct of whenever fire and water touch. Oil works exactly the same as water in movement, except it's very flammable. And acid works exactly the same in movement as any other liquid, but it's very highly corrosive and will eat through most things. So I think we have our basic implementation down, but as a final polish, let's go ahead and make this feel like an actual tool where you can select whatever particle you want to paint with on the side. Visually, everything's pretty underwhelming, so let's add in a bit of post-processing, like some bloom, and a little bit of gamma correction. Yeah, that's feeling better, but there's still something not right to me. See, most cellular automatas, you can paint in little states, but typically you start with a starting state. And we're not really doing that here. So here's what I want to do. Let's allow the user to drag and drop images from disk into the program. Then we'll take all the pixel data from that image and we'll create particles for each one so that we can interact with the scene. Now you'll notice most images are rich in color. They're typically 32-bit RGBA. And we have a very limited color palette with just our particles. So what we'll have to do is very simply map this rich 32-bit RGBA data down to our small limited palette. And this is easy enough to do. We'll just look at every single pixel and we'll match that with our palette range and based on a least Euclidean distance algorithm, we'll select the most appropriate one. Of course, there's gonna be artifacts with this, but it's simple enough for this application and I really think it has a certain sense of charm to it. So, that's it for the video. I hope you found this interesting. All the source code for this project is available online, open source. I'll have a GitHub link down in the description. I'm also going to put a link to my Discord channel, so if you have any questions about games, graphics, or programming in general, feel free to jump on there and ask me or any one of the other devs that's on there. And I'm kind of treating this as a launchpad for a new series, where I'd like to look at mechanics, especially from popular video games, and dissect those and kind of do my own implementation. So if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see, please let me know in the comments or in the Discord channel. I'd love to hear from you. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.